From the keyboard to the boardroom, this is the business of esports. Do you want to own your esports fandom and support your favorite content creators and gamers? Artera Labs is a world-renowned NFT platform with a focus on esports and gaming markets. Their climate-neutral platform enables users to find, mint, trade, and purchase items from some of the top influencers and esports organizations. It's easy to use and even easier to sign up for. Don't miss out on the modern-day NFT gold rush. Just go to artera.co to learn more. That's A-R-T-E-R-R-A dot C-O. From the keyboard to the boardroom, this is the Business of Esports podcast. I am Paul Dewalibi. I'm joined today by my friend and co-host, the Honorable Judge Jimmy Barada. For those of you who are new to the podcast, welcome to the official podcast of esports. What we do here is we cover the most pressing gaming and esports topics and news of the week, but we look at all of it through a business and C-suite lens. We dissect. We analyze the business implications of everything happening in this industry. For our regular listeners, thank you guys for coming back every week. Thank you for all the love, the support you give the podcast. If you haven't yet, go leave a five-star rating and review wherever you get our podcast. Make sure to subscribe everywhere also. I know we have accounts basically on every social media platform on the planet. So whether it's on TikTok or YouTube or Instagram or Twitter or wherever you get our content, really appreciate the subscription. And tell your friends about the podcast. That's how we continue to grow this. Jimmy, how are you doing this week? Hey, Paul. Hey to all our listeners. Happy podcast day. It's uh, my favorite day of the week where I get to come <laughs> on the show and just talk shop. Uh, having a great week, Paul. How about yourself? Um, this was a difficult week, Jimmy. I'll tell you why. It got difficult. Because we, as most, maybe many of our listeners probably know, especially old like listeners who've been with us a long time know, we tape the show on Wednesdays. And it comes out typically on Thursday, sometimes Friday, depending on, depending on sort of how the week's going, but almost always on a Thursday. This week, obviously, there was the huge Activision Blizzard news, right? Microsoft buying Activision Blizzard, which I'm sure we're for sure we're going to get to on this show and we're going to get to on our weekly news show, which, by the way, every Wednesday night, 8.30 p.m. Eastern time, if you guys don't come and watch it, I'm going to be really upset because it's great and we get to do it live with you guys. but. Um, because of the nature of when the news came out, because of the, you know, the news came out at the beginning of the week, I just had people harassing me on every platform, <laughs> right? On LinkedIn, on Twitter, like, yeah. what do you think about this? You know, what does the prophet think about, you know, what's going on here? And I want to answer, right? Like I, I've probably typed up a whole long answer at least four or five times, whether it's replying to someone on LinkedIn or on Twitter or whatever. And then I have to hold myself back because I know... <laughs> We're going to cover it on the podcast and I don't want to just, you know, put it all out there. I don't want to put all the, all my thoughts out there before we do it on the show. So it's been a frustrating yeah. couple of days. You got to make them wait for it. My thoughts. <laughs> which, which I know doesn't sit well with you. You know, it's, fu it's funny. I, you know, obviously it's mega, mega news, like you said, but this is how big the news is in terms of like a personal anecdote. The first two people to tell me were not gaming or esports or anyone in the industry. The first person was literally my mom who sent me an article. And then it was my doctor because he knows that I left, you know, to, to join this industry. And so like these, right, like how random is that? And kind of funny that it's just massive news that, you know, people outside of our industry that just, oh, this is video game related, not really grasping the magnitude of this acquisition. So as you mentioned, we'll talk about it on the live stream tonight, 830 Eastern. And I don't want you to shy away the people that might be a little bit more introverted or reserved. If you want to listen to it offline, you can also download the stream and, <laughs> and listen regularly at your own pace and schedule. But it is more fun when we have people there. We read a lot of the comments. We interact with your questions. And it actually does change sometimes the flow of the show because we'll spend more time on a topic or we'll field certain perspectives. So um, if you haven't listened to the live show yet, 
it's definitely the best place for your weekly news, not just in terms of what those what that news is, but why it's important and, and what the analysis is. Jimmy, um, we have a, an amazing, amazing guest this week, and I don't want to I don't want to shortchange him on time at all. I do just want to say one other thing this week, which is big. Um, we are launching Business of Esports. So uh, for those of you who don't know, Business of Esports is now part of a bigger umbrella brand called Meta TV. If you love Business of Esports, you should go check out some of the other meta content we're doing, Meta Business, which is a podcast I'm hoping I'm hosting with uh, our very own Jeff the Juice Cohen. Uh, and Lindsay Poss, who, who started at the Business of Esports, is now hosting Meta Woman, another podcast you should all subscribe to. But this week, we are launching our very own Discord server for everyone to come join, talk about the business of gaming, talk about the business of esports, talk about the business of the metaverse, all these fun topics. And uh, I will be in there, you know, having those conversations. I know Jimmy's in there. All the cast from Business of Esports are in there. So definitely... If you're a listener of this podcast, you're a fan of this podcast, go check it out. Discord.gg slash Meta TV. Um, so super simple to come join. Open to all of you guys, all of our listeners, and uh, would love to have you in there. Jimmy, we have to get to our guest. I don't say this very often. Easily one of my favorite guests of all time. I'm so excited to have him on the show. Um, we have today none other than the chief operating officer and co-founder of OTK. For those of you who don't know, OTK stands for One True King. Uh, I would say one of the most exciting, call it esports slash content orgs on the planet slash media companies. Uh, but I'll let him describe it. Welcome, Tips. Welcome to the Business of Esports podcast. Thanks for having me, Paul and Jimmy. I really appreciate it. And you got me gassed up, man. One of the favorites, huh? I, uh, <laughs> that's great. Why aren't we doing this at Benny Hanna then, man? Why am I on my couch? Am I <laughs> <laughs> this is your fault. I'm pretty sure we offered hibachi and you said, no way I want to do this. Uh, <laughs> um, that That's true. That's We should do, Jimmy, I think this is a good idea. We Can we take this tips? We should do more episodes from Benny Hanna live from the grill. Listen, when, the, when they stack <laughs> up those onions and the smoke comes out, it gets me. A <laughs> so I won't say no to that, but I'm just busting your balls, man. No, I <laughs> the intro. And I appreciate the invite, and I'm really excited to talk to you guys tonight. Tips for those of you who don't know about you or OTK, which I think it's probably very few, but would love a bit of the backstory your, in terms of like how you got into gaming, why you got into gaming, you know what you guys are focused on at OTK, what you're doing there, what you're building there. Would love a bit of that story. For sure. So I guess um, I guess I'll, I'll kind of go back to the beginning. So. Um, I've always kind of been a gamer, you know, in the days and, and Jimmy probably remembers uh, back in the day when, you know, being a gamer wasn't exactly the most popular thing in the world. It was kind of like this, this hobby we entertained and we kind of kept it in the closet and didn't talk about it too much publicly. But, um, you know, it's, it's just something I've done. It's, it's been a great hobby. And, you know, as I got older and, and as, you know, websites like YouTube started to come out and proliferate a bit. Um, the idea of content creation around gaming and potentially a career around gaming uh, became very appetizing to me. Um, at the you know behest of my my parents, I think you know they weren't too uh, too excited about that. So I kind of went along the route of the dutiful son, went into the engineering world, uh, graduated from Purdue University in 2012, got into construction engineering, and uh, was really doing that for close to seven years. Um, more or less, seven years or so, uh, until 2017, I believe. It was uh, November 2017, BlizzCon at the time. Uh, one of my most near and dear games to my heart, a game called World of Warcraft, was returning its classic form. And that was the form of the game that I fell in love with and really consumed you know, the greater part of my adolescence and, and early adulthood, even in college, um, and because that game was just so awesome and near and dear to me, I decided, you know what, this is a sign. I've always wanted to get into gaming content creation, never found the opportunity to do so. And it feels like this is something that I'm passionate about, I can talk about, and I'm willing to take a chance on. So it was, you know, I think November 2017, I took the plunge into YouTube, uh, started making content around Classic WoW and was fortunate to uh, to find some some relatively early success and meet some great people along the way. So that was kind of my foray into content creation. Um, YouTube started going pretty well. And I heard, you know, 
didn't really hear. I'd, ar- I'd already known a lot of the, the monetization was really on Twitch at the time. So I transitioned into streaming. That started to go pretty well. Uh, and eventually I transitioned into tournament organizing after Classic WoW released because I knew that a lot of money seemed to be in actual you know, media products um, and being able to sell you know, sponsored inventory on actual streams instead of just doing your regular live stream. So I pretty much transitioned into full-time tournament organizing sometime in 2020 um, and uh, all the way through until, you know, end of 2020, around August, September, I was approached by one of my friends at the time who I'd gotten to know over the years, Asmongold, as well as Rich Campbell and S-Band. And uh, they had pretty much hit me up about, you know, starting an organization together and um, we had had discussions like this previously, but at the time, you know, in previous times, the timing never seemed right. You know, someone was either in an organization or, you know, just the stars didn't align in one way or another. Um, so it, it was, you know, August, September of 2020, where the conversation really started to get moving. And they needed somebody on the back end who knew a little bit of the business side of the industry, who had worked, you know, on startups, who had worked in getting businesses up and running to manage the project behind the scenes. So that's why they came to me. Essentially, they had the vision and they're like, we don't want to do any of the work. We need you tips. Can you just do everything for us? So uh, here I am, you know, a year and a half later, lost my hair, put on some weight, but it's been a great journey. <laughs> Uh, I, I I love that you threw that in there, Tips, because this is my excuse also, right? It's just, this is what happens when you're so focused on the business. I, does this mean you've given up WoW, though? Because I don't, I, I, I could never manage, I know it's not probably the worst spurt question to start with, but I've never been able to manage WoW and actually building a business at the same time. Oh, absolutely. You hit the nail on the head. I can't remember who posted it, but it was like three or so years ago. I remember seeing a chart um, from from an executive in our space. It might have been somebody from Liquid, uh, but essentially the chart was, you know, I think the, the x-axis was uh, uh, an amount of years in the gaming industry and the y-axis was uh, how much time you spend playing games. And the longer you're in the industry, the less time you end up playing games. And <laughs> truthfully, I haven't actually sat down and just played a video game aside from like a quick, you know, 10, 20, 30 minute session. in I would say since August or September of 2020, ever since we started, it, uh, I had a stint there where I played a little bit of hollow Knight, but for the most part, it's, it's just been work. And, you know, as uh, it's, it's great that we have that adjacency where we still get to see the stuff on the peripheral and, You know, when I'm working, I've got Miz or Asmin or anybody else in OTK on my second monitor. But to just sit there and play and enjoy for the entertainment aspect, unfortunately, not since we started. (laughs) I I know the feeling all too well. I also went back to WoW Classic, so I was hardcore WoW fan, you know, from from years ago. But I went back to Classic and I I did the whole grind, like very serious grind. PvP and PvE grind. It was like one of the top mages in the world. Um, and, uh, and I realized, holy, I, like, I, I cannot manage this and my business at the same time. This is actually impossible. One of these has to go. Um, I, I tried I was, hiring Jimmy, hoping that would make things better. But. <laughs> I only ended up giving you more work to do. Uh, I, I will say the difference though, Paul, is that tips has about, you know, hundreds of thousands of people that are wondering when he's going to keep playing some more, True. True. <laughs> like your page. <laughs> Although, did you do the frost saber grind? Did you do that grind? I didn't. I rolled horde, so I didn't do that grind. Oh, okay. Nice. Okay. I did. No, no. Uh, now I know. Tips. We can never be friends. <laughs> 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 <All right. laughs> you know, it's funny. I, in actual vanilla, like in 2004, I played horde, and then um, towards I think it was Wrath of the Lich King, humans got a racial that was just super overpowered called Every Man for Himself, which allowed you to break out of pretty much any stun or root. So yeah. I switched to Alliance, played Alliance, you know, from Wrath of the Lich King all the way until pretty much Classic came back. So I got a lot of love for the Alliance, played it for many years, but, you know, those orc racial abilities, dude, I couldn't pass up on them. Yeah, but gear just looks better on a human, let's face it. It's true. Um, <laughs> <laughs> for me, we're friends, I'm just, I'm playing. <laughs> uh, Tips, let's talk about OTK a bit, because, uh, you know... I'm a big fan of what you guys are doing there, but I'd love for you to articulate, and I'm curious how you think about OTK in the context 
of other esports orgs. And let me just give you a bit of a bit of a bit more context there. I I have qual like sort of qualified all esports orgs on some kind of spectrum. Where at one end you have like hoodie orgs, like what I'll call hundred thieves, right? Where a lot of the revenues from apparel, a lot of the thinking and a lot of the effort and resources are around merch and you know how to monetize your brand that way. And then there's another end of the spectrum, which is like more media company. Um, and then there's a third axis where like media company where it's all content. And then I would say there's a third axis where it's like all about winning, right? So there are esports orgs that are about winning championships and don't care about the merch as much. Um, where would you put OTK in this spectrum of esports orgs? If you even, I don't know if you even call yourselves that officially. No, it's uh, it's it's actually a really good question, and it's one that I feel like has evolved over the past year and a half. When we started the organization, we did essentially announce a team that we had signed early on, um, but what we quickly found, and we had you know somewhat suspected, but you know I guess was confirmed uh, throughout the course of our first you know six or seven months was that the esports team model is, um, I mean, to put it transparently, and I hope I don't offend anybody, but it's not very profitable. Uh, there's a very high you know, price of admission on top of the fact that you've got player salaries, you've got managers, you've got flights, hotel rooms, um, and it just continues to escalate. You know, Some of the player salaries you hear today, you're just like, whoa, man, how, how can you make money off of this? And so, um, you know, relatively early on, we decided to kind of halt the, the team initiative and lean more towards our bread and butter, what, what had succeeded at, up until that point, which was our content. And so I guess to answer your question, the way we describe ourselves internally is we're an influencer network and media company. We're kind of built on, you know, the pillars of finding the best, most authentic content creators that jive together. With those creators developing the best, most innovative, most engaging content in digital media, and then from there, hopefully building up a brand and, and building up a community uh, that we can do a lot of cool things with, launch a lot of really cool initiatives towards. So definitely for us, it's all about the creators and the content. Um, and that's led us, you know, kind of back into esports a little bit recently, uh, just about four or five days ago, actually, we hosted an Apex Legends Invitational where we did the full you know, production from A to Z. Um, we subcontracted uh, the actual broadcasting to, to a, a company in the space, but essentially we recruited the talent for the event. We designed all the assets and graphics. We were the actual broadcasting talent. Uh, one of our, one of our uh, uh, principals, Nick Pollum, as well as Finn, who's our camera guy, uh, they put on the broadcast. And we hit close to 200,000 concurrent viewers over the course of the four-hour broadcast. So... It was a very successful event, and it's definitely it's definitely caused us to, I guess, um, you know, revisit the prospect of an esports angle, but from the media perspective and the content perspective, less so from the team perspective. I mean, uh, is it fair to say then that you act because I, I like that sort of influencer network piece of it? I think it's interesting. It's differentiated. Does does that mean you see? Uh, and for, like, stop me if you think I'm I'm off base here. Are you more competitive with a talent agency in the space than another esports org? Right, like, are, are are you guys the like the pitch to this to an influencer? If you're if you're approaching a new influencer, what is that pitch to them? Is it we're going to bring you sponsors, we're going to bring you brands that want to work with you, so join us? Because that feels like a, a lot of the function of the agencies, and in some ways, I like that because I've always felt like the talent agencies eventually sort of get disintermediated, right? Eventually that middleman goes away. Um, but curious how, how you see that piece of it in particular. So not to toot our own horn here or anything like that. Uh, we very much, oh, that's exactly what you want, you want <laughs> you to do tips. This is the opportunity to do it. <laughs> All right, let's do it. Full send. Um, we actually kind of see ourselves in between those two entities. Um, we're not a talent agency in the sense that we're not, you know, licensed as licensed as a talent agency or talent agency or anything like that. All of our principals and all of our signed talent have their own representation, whether it be agents, managements, or both. Um, we do block off a certain number of categories where you know we we procure these categories and essentially um, you know assign the deliverables to our talent. But they're very few and far between when you compare us to like any esports team where you know they pretty much put their uh, talent under contract and 
the talent has to do all the obligations for the orgs. We don't really do that. Um, our value proposition to prospective talent is we'll grow your stream. We'll give you autonomy to get, you know, 80 to 90 percent of your sponsorships through your own representation. And in terms of content, we will build content around you. And, you know, again, not to toot our own horn, but we're probably one of the only organizations, at least in the live content sphere and the Twitch sphere, that can effectively do this. We just signed three talents over the past four or so months, um, and all of them have substantially increased their viewership. Most recently, we signed uh, Emeru, who's our first, um, our first female broadcaster. We're super excited to have her on. She went from approximately, you know, one and a half thousand average viewers to now closer to 10 to 15,000 average viewers um, wow. ever since she started working with us. So um, we're, we're kind of like this talent incubator slash, you know, I wouldn't call us an agency, but we do bring, you know, some deals for the mm -hmm. organization. Um, we don't really pitch out our talent on individual deals or activations or anything like that. We just get some inbound every once in a while. Uh, but for us, again, it's, it's really that content. We build out, you know, unique IP and unique media pieces that we then sell to sponsors um, or we sell direct to specific platforms. So uh, we don't, again, we don't represent talent direct. We uh, instead, we build out content with talent that we then sell to sponsors. So, so for your growth then, I suppose in the next, you know, months and years, how do you see OTK growing and, 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 you know, besides signing talent and coming up with new content and IP, are there any additional verticals or, or areas that you're looking into that you haven't shared with what's been the traditional or the, or the foundational model? For sure. So, um, you know, one of the things that we strongly believe, and again, this is not a knock on any esports team or anything like that. Uh, we feel like content creators especially certain a certain classification of creator um they're just better activators they you know they're just they've got a more authentic connection with their community and you know when you bring a lot of those authentic creators that have that tight connection with their community together um and you're able to create a brand around that the opportunities are endless um whether it be tackling you know divergent ventures such as you know starting up you know, we joked around the other day, let's start a, an underwear line, a boxers line, for example. Um, or, you know, you see like guys like Mr. Beastburger out there doing the cloud kitchen thing. Um, I think Logan Paul and KSI just launched like a water brand and stuff like that. That's kind of where we see ourselves moving, uh, continuing to build, you know, what we consider to be the best live content out there, building a brand and a community around it. And hopefully at some point, um, qualifying and identifying different products and services that we think our community get really excited about and that give value to their you know experience their gaming experience and potentially going after those verticals ourselves and and start uh building them ourselves internally so that's kind of the direction we see ourselves obviously scaling with talent to create more media projects more shows more events you know more esports tournaments and selling those to sponsors as we scale but also, you know, potentially as we grow the community, identifying certain verticals that we think the community would really like us to get into and, and building products and services uh, to service them in that respect. So, you know, we, we have a conversation like this uh, on the show every once in a while, the difference between authenticity and, and uh, someone, you know, with authority and, and having that knowledge and, and what I think is more meaningful or impactful or what audiences relate to more. I'm curious how you see that, not just in relation to, you know, OTK as a brand and as a network, but also the talent that you, you, know, you mentioned just signing for new uh, content creators. So I suppose I'm curious uh, and, you know, run with this and I don't know, however it works for you, but one, you know, what is authentic or rather what's your core as who your group is, you know, uh, individually and collectively, as well as what you look for in creators. And then as far as launching these products, you know, you had mentioned water and underwear, you know, underwear actually to, to what I know about you guys would be a funny and a pretty good fit. Right. Um, so what are, I suppose, those activations that you think you would look into uh, because it's something that aligns with, with that core of who you guys are? For sure. I mean, you know, going to the talent, um, we look at ourselves, you know, it's, it's kind of a, like a kind of a rough comparison here, but like one of my favorite movies of all time was dodgeball with like Vince nice. 
and stuff like that. Um, <laughs> we very much look at ourselves as the average Joes. Uh, we're, we're and, and like in comparison, you know, in contrast, I should say, you know, we've got like uh, some of our colleagues, you know, across the aisle, like a hundred thieves. We look at them as kind of the globo gems, and not in a bad. <laughs> place. This, like this is maybe the best analogy I have <laughs> ever heard. Ever, this is just so good. It works, doesn't it? It's like yeah, they're they're the kind of refined, you know, very cutting edge, sleek esports team slash apparel company. Um, we've got a tremendous amount of respect for their business model and how they're approaching things. We think they're absolutely phenomenal. We just look at ourselves as kind of the other side of the demographic spectrum where uh, we're not very refined. A lot of us are late 20s, early to mid 30s, balding, a little bit overweight or a little bit underweight males uh, that just <laughs> we just love gaming. And um, and obviously that extends beyond the male category. Emeru is like you know, she's one of us through and through. And, and that's that's the type of person that we look to uh, when we're recruiting. We don't really look at numbers too much. We don't really look at analytics. We look at people that we think just kind of fit our vibe that we think can hang out with us and us hang out with them. And it's fun on stream and off stream. And um, that just kind of capture that feeling of, you know, those homies you grew up with playing video games with. So that's kind of what our brand is built off of. It's just this kind of, we're a scuffed org, more or less, at least from, from the public side of things. Um, and then in terms of like, like different verticals and activations, I mean, you hit the nail on the head, Jimmy, you know, under where we feel like it's a gag, it's something that we can do that's funny, but at the same time, you know, we, we want to tackle it with, with some element of professionalism and make sure they're the most comfortable boxers out there. Um, anything that, that kind of has that, you know, innuendo below it, where it's like on one hand, it's a very useful product where we feel like we can we can you know tackle it and make a high quality version of it, but also you know it's got that kind of tongue in cheek innuendo you know on top of it uh, where we we feel like you know our community would really enjoy and, and kind of treat as an Easter egg. That's the kind of thing we go after. And I want to talk about a lot of them in particular, but I don't want to you know spoil any announcements or surprises. Uh, we are working on several ventures though right now. Tips, this is the perfect place to announce them. I, I don't know if you, <laughs> if you so feel inclined. But um, no, I, I think this is the genius of what you guys are doing. Like that in a nutshell. And, and Jimmy asked a great question. And I was going to ask the same one, right? Which is, what is the criteria? Because I think part of what's so obvious about OTK when you watch any of your content creators is there's something a little bit different here, right? It's not your run-of-the-mill Twitch streamers. It's not. It's not like everything else you see out there. And that unique sort of thing, that that characteristic, that quality, whatever you want to call it, like, is that something you think you can scale to 100 content creators, 200 content creators? Like, to me, you've captured lightning in a bottle. It's totally genius. It's totally unique, right? Um, how big can this get in your mind while still maintaining what makes you guys really special and not become Globo Gym, right? For sure. No, absolutely. It's a question we ask ourselves every day. And uh, the answer that we've pretty much you know, come to default to is there is a ceiling on terms of talent scaling. There's going to be a point where, you know, there's just too many heads in the room and it starts to feel less and less like, you know, hanging out with your friends after school and more and more like a business. And the way we've tried to delineate, you know, this or at least, you know, approach this issue as we scale is you know, when you look at a lot, a lot of the different record labels, um, you know, uh, I'm trying to think of like some examples, but but like the boy band model, let's call it, where you've got your Backstreet Boys, you've got your InSync's, uh, you've got your Spice Girls, you've got your you know so on and so forth. Um, a lot of those, a lot of those different bands and groups growing up, they were all managed by the same labels. And, um, you know, entertainment is a constantly churning industry. You know, you're only popular for a very specific amount of time and you try to get what you can during that time. And eventually your star kind of fades away 99.9% .9 of the cases. So from our perspective, the way we keep that authenticity is, you know, we, we have to be honest with ourselves when we feel like we've got a great group and the dynamic is perfect. And when we want to go beyond that, it's about starting potentially a new group, financing a new group of friends that have those authentic connections together and with their communities that might not necessarily, you know, be presented the same way we are. Maybe, you know, it's it's a different slant on it or a different demographic, you know, cultural demographic, et cetera. 
But, you know, giving them, providing them the resources to sort of, you know, uh, you know, pick up the mantle and carry the brand forward um, uh, and and just continue on with with a new set of people. So for us, it's just about, you know, you, do we we agree there is potentially a limit on how many talent we can pick up for this particular group? But we think there's limitless possibilities in terms of how many ecosystems we can set up with specific groups of talent that we think will still capture the magic of OTK, albeit to a different you know, group or generation of people. Yeah, I, I, it's an interesting, it's a really interesting thought, Tips, because I think no one has done that, right? No one has shown that this is possible yet. And I think because of the way you look at the world, this this feels possible, right? That you could build sort of these little microcosms, these little friend groups or, you know, whatever analogy you're, you're using there, um, that it does seem possible. Can we talk a little bit about the original IP that you guys create? Uh, you know, whether it was, and again, I watch so many of your streamers, um, whether it was like Friendsgiving or it's parasocial or whatever, like original IP that you guys are doing. Can you talk a little bit about the process that goes into that? Like, is it, is it the creator that comes up with it and you guys are there sort of as the support? Is it, you know, what does that process internally look like? And what are, what are some of the criteria that you guys use to sort of figure out, yes, this is something we want to do or no, you know, not such a great idea. For sure. Um, so, you know, to be completely honest with you, it's, you know, t- at 2.37 AM, I'll get a call from Ms. Yo, I just got an idea. You know, let's do who wants to be a millionaire plus are you smarter than a fifth grader? And let's call it schooled. It's like, all right, let's do it. Shit, why not? Um, the beauty about our space right now is there is there aren't a lot of groups uh, that are kind of delving into the world of like produced content, especially weekly recurring content the way we are. And there are a lot of reasons for that. Uh, one of which is Live content has definitely not been solved, and it's a lot more difficult than people realize. And, you know, um, there's been a couple of, you know, contemporaries of ours in the space that uh, have tried to, you know, raise a tremendous amount of capital to produce like live content shows or entire platforms or stations. And it's been a struggle for them. And, um, you know, some of them are, are coming to us and, you know, some of them are joining the team relatively soon. But, it's tough, man. Live content is not easy. It's hyper competitive. You know, you're all you're only as good as your last show. Um, and in terms of viewership, it can all the ceiling is only as high as who else is on competing in your same time slot. So we don't really have a formula. It's more or less, you know, somebody comes up with an idea, they think it's pretty cool. We run it by the group. What does everybody else think? And usually, you know. With the parasocial element of live streaming, where again, it's so creator focused and that connection between creator and community, usually if the creator's jazzed up on the idea, it's going to succeed. You know, we don't have, you know, an, an analytics team that's like evaluating, you know, the, the financial, you know, the probability of like financial success or how much viewership we're going to get on this idea and how does it compare to a previous show we've done. If the creator themselves is excited about it, and the other creators like give that validating nod, then we do it. Um, and, you know, that's why, you know, our, our approach is more volume than, you know, refining specific IPs. Um, we probably have six or seven IPs coming out of last year that we're carrying forward into this year, but we probably did around 30 different shows last year. So about 25%-ish, you know, I don't want to say success rate, but 25% of the time we think something's cool enough to run it back. Um, and I think that's really, you know, for us, that's, that's our best strategy. It's trying different things. The live streaming audience, you know, is always craving novelty and they always want to see something new. So it just kind of works that way where the more we try, usually the more successful we find our shows to be. So, you know, the process, it's not, uh, it's not a bunch of suits sitting around a conference table. It's not even, you know, like a writer's room where we have some, you know, industry creatives that come up with all of our ideas for us. It's, you know, uh, someone, you know, is just hanging out with somebody else and, you know, they're watching something or, you know, some idea comes to them and, uh, and they usually hit me up about it and, and I do my best to bring it all together. I love to hear that. I share a similar view. And, and when people ask me, you know, privately, I really think quantity is the name of the game in the content space, right? Cause 
you don't really know ahead of time. You can, you can have all the analytics in the world. You don't really know ahead of time what's going to resonate and what won't with an audience. Absolutely. Um, and I just think some of the things you guys have tried is is just really out there, right? It's really quirky. And, and you know, if it was a room full of suits, probably 90% of it would never have made it out the door. Um, so it speaks to the, the process you do have, even if it's a lack of process. Uh, it clearly has created some some gems. Um, Tips, I'm curious about, uh, you know, change, switch gears a little bit, but I want to riff off of one thing you said first, which was, you know, you said there's a bunch of players that have raised a ton of money in the content space. You know, why do you think, and I'll, I'm, I'm making an assumption here, why do you think Venn failed? So um, why do I think Venn failed? Um, I think there could be a variety of different factors. There's so many variables that go into producing online content, especially a 24-hour content slate, you yeah. know, in the digital media age, super, super competitive. But one common thread that I found with, you know, any sort of elevated content seems to be that if the right talent is there, and the right talent doesn't always mean the most professional or seasoned talent. But the right talent in that they're integrated with Twitch culture, they understand their audience, and they have that authentic connection with their community, that's where you find success. Um, and that's what we've seen with our own influencers. You know, if Ms. Kiff were to go out and open up the Watch Ven programming and recreate some of those shows, I would take a guess that he would probably find a lot more success, despite the fact that he doesn't have the multi-million dollar production backing. He doesn't have the studio, the facilities, et cetera, just by virtue of him having that understanding of Twitch culture and that authentic connection with his community, the show itself would elevate his viewership, but he would still do, you know, a fantastic job on his own. So um, I would say that's probably, you know, the biggest hurdle to leap over if you are one of these, um, not necessarily over the top, but just one of these production studios, these new media companies coming into the space. The only way you will truly find success is if you manage to snag up some incredible talent. And the truth is the talent that's worth snagging up is just so far beyond your reach. You're gonna have to pay millions upon millions of dollars to get you know one hour of one streamer every week. And so the value proposition just might not be there. Um, and you know, talking about you know, G4, who's kind of going through the gauntlet right now, if you look at G4's most successful streams, funny enough, I think two of their most successful, and they might actually literally be number one and number two, were uh, their summer, I think they called it like their summer jam streams back in summer earlier this year, where they invited uh, all of OTK content creators, or at least <laughs> Ms. Kiff, NMP, S Band, et cetera. <laughs> they brought them out. Uh, and it Shameless was really plug. The, exactly. Well, it was at the request of Austin, who's who works for G4. He does a segment or a show at G4. Uh, and Austin's a friend of ours. Will Neff is a friend of ours. So they asked us to come out. We came out and those streams hit like 50 to 60,000 viewers uh, concurrently. And I'm not sure if G4 has had, you know, has been able to capture that that success ever since. Maybe they have no, no disrespect or anything. But again, it just comes back to the talent. If you've got the right talent that's ingrained in the community, you will likely find success. But if you can't secure that talent, investing 20, 30, 40 million dollars into a studio that's going to run 24 seven, I would probably caution against that and advise more into investing that money into media content, esports tournaments, content creator tournaments, all of Twitch rivals. That's where you will find more success. Uh, and at least that's, that's been our experience so far. I think the talent in the community, uh, insight is a good one you know as someone that manages and runs a lot of talent you have this massive you know collective of big names right and and really popular streamers how do you keep talent happy you know that's the other thing that I, you know we see a lot of talent that want equity or that are jumping or that are going solo you know as someone that has a lot of these big talent uh names affiliated with your brand you know and also we were talked earlier, you know, about growing and, and acquiring more talent. You know, what are the things that you want to do to make sure that they're happy? And also what are the things that you see them asking for, for you know, that you can't provide as far as like, oh God, you know, I wish I could do this on my stream, you know, things that you might be reaching out to a Twitch, to a YouTube saying, hey, can you support us in this type of pursuit? Because we're, you know, our current, uh, you know, partner, our current 
platform is really lacking with that infrastructure, with those capabilities. For sure. So in terms of making talent happy, um, I think, you know, I think it's, it's, we're probably at a point in the industry where, uh, and, and I'm starting to see this more often with larger content creator contracts from esports orgs. I think we just have to acknowledge the value of the talent. Um, you just saw relatively recently, Tim signed, you know, a deal with complexity. They're not just writing him a check every month. He's got ownership in that company, a company that's been around for years and years and years. Um, but they had to give up a substantial amount of equity to retain Tim. And you know what? Tim is one of the best influencers in the world at both, you know, scale and also quality and brand friendliness. It's worth it. The guy is freaking valuable. Um, and this is one thing about OTK that that I, I don't think I talked about earlier on. We're 100 percent talent owned and we plan to continue to be 100 percent talent owned and operated even. Um, all of our principals have have a stake in the company and they're all talent. Uh, and that's one of the biggest incentives to keep them invested in the organization. You know, they know they can go out there, you know, Asman can go out there, Miz can go out there, Nick can go out there and charge twenty, thirty, forty thousand dollars an hour for a stream activation with a particular brand. But, you know, if they they also recognize that they've done super well so far in their careers, there's a much bigger opportunity with a much larger multiplier to instead build up a company, build up a business. Where that you know forty thousand dollars coming in isn't just forty thousand dollars into your bank account. It could potentially be ten to twenty times that value in the long term. So giving talent, you know, uh, a tangible, long term, you know, financially lucrative opportunity through equity, in my opinion, should be baseline and eventually will be baseline for a lot of these esports teams uh, if they want to pick up you know high quality you know content creators. Um, and then on top of that, you know, beyond the equity, in my experience, the best way to keep talent happy is to give them great streams, build great content around them, provide opportunities for them to engage their community in a unique way. And, you know, let them see that viewer count number. The average is 10,000. Well, if we do a program with you, you're going to have 30,000, 40,000 that day. Um, because there's nothing like seeing your viewer count go up, regardless of who you are. It just makes you feel better. It makes you feel all warm and fuzzy on the inside. And there's nothing worse than seeing that viewer count go down. So that's really one of the biggest hurdles content creators, you know, have to leap over. It's that, you know, that viewer count issue. If you can give them good viewers on a good show, time and time again, you'll see them, you'll see them happy. You'll see them playing ball, working with you. And uh, and I think that's that's really what what solidified OTK's bond to one another it's you know we all we all have equity in this organization we're all, par we're all partners but regardless of how we do on the business side on the personal level everyone's benefiting because they're just getting better quality streams and higher viewership so you know the business thing just becomes almost a side note we're great it's growing awesome uh, but also day to day i'm having more success with this team rather than without them tips can we talk about like one of the implications or a couple of the implications of what you, you know, what you said here on the talent side. Um, I, I think one of the arguments that you would get um, to, to what you just said, especially in relation to G4 and Venn is, well, you know, Mixer hired a bunch of high price talent, right? They, they picked up Ninja, they picked up Shroud and that sort of didn't pan out, right? The audience, while some came definitely not enough to sort of, to, to be conclusive that it's all about the talent and the talents, the draw and sort of, it doesn't matter where they go. You know, the, their fans will always follow the talent. So I'm curious to get your perspective sort of on that pushback. And then the second implication, I think of what you said is potentially that to become a miskiff sort of size streamer today is basically impossible. Call it organically, right? It's like you need the, the you know the the extra push of something like an otk or a hundred thieves or a phase or what like whatever org is around you to propel because again a, a lot of the fan base is only at the very top of the pyramid and to get there it's really hard to stand out right uh, it, again i'm stretching some of what you're saying here but i'm curious what you think of those two things for sure both very very good points so starting at you know, the talent and, you know, some of the, the experimentation that happened with Mixer on, on Shroud and Ninja. Um, you know, in my opinion, there's talent and then there's talent. 
There's, you know, if, if you go, if you go to McDonald's, you know, you can go and get a hamburger for what, a dollar 29. Um, and then if you go to five guys or in and out, you can go and get a hamburger for X amount. And then if you go to Gordon Ramsay's special hell's kitchen or whatever, you can go and get a hamburger for a little bit more money, all hamburgers, all food at the end of the day, but there's a difference of quality between each one. And that's not to say that Ninja and Shroud are not great streamers. Shroud, in my opinion, Pantheon of Twitch, one of the best live broadcasters of all time. But, you know, specifically more so with Ninja, a lot of Ninja's growth, and this is not to take anything away from him, tremendous respect for Ninja. But, you know, I'm, I'm sure he would be the first to admit a lot of his explosive growth was circumstantial. He was in the right place at the right time streaming the right game. There are some streamers that are a byproduct of their time, their place, or the game that they play. And there are some streamers that are just genuine entertainers where they could be playing, you know, Mario Kart 64. One day they could be playing Metroid. The next day they could be playing Call of Duty the next day. And they could be doing a just chatting stream the day after that. And every single one of those streams will have comparable viewership. Those are the unicorn streamers. And that's what I mean by the talent that you're looking for. Um, and, you know, uh, surprise, surprise, a lot of the FPS competitive gamer streamers aren't the unicorn streamers. You find a lot of the unicorn streamers spending their time in just chatting or in similar categories where their personality has an opportunity to come out. And once you have that great, if you have a great charismatic personality and your community is drawn to you, that community isn't going to leave whether you're playing Call of Duty or Mario or whatever you're playing. They're there to watch you. Um, whereas, again, in the case of, of Ninja, maybe people were there to watch the Fortnite gameplay or they were there just because everybody else was there. Um, that's not always the case with talent. So that's how I would answer the talent question. Um, and there's there's only a handful. I'd say there's maybe 50 or so broadcasters on Twitch that I would put in that unicorn category. Um, but those are the ones that I think deserve the equity and deserve a big stake in any initiative that anyone's trying to bring them on board for. Maybe close to 100, but between 50 and 100. Um, and to answer the question of, I'm sorry, what was the second question? The second question is, it like that 50 to 100 group, mm -hmm. right? Like if you're, and this comes up on Twitch all the time, right? Like if I'm, if I'm starting on Twitch tomorrow, is there any chance to get into that 50 or 100 group in your mind if at some point I'm not aligned with an OTK, with 100 Thieves, with a whoever, right? Like, is have, have organizations like yours become in some ways gatekeepers of that 50 to 100 group of unicorns? So if you started on Twitch tomorrow, you will never find success. And it's not because of you know, the landscape today, although I do think it's definitely trending in that direction that you brought up, Paul, that eventually it's going to be harder and harder. But it's because you started on Twitch. What a lot of people don't realize is a lot of the top performers on Twitch did not start on Twitch. They were massive YouTube streamers. They came from different platforms, Instagram stars, TikTok stars, etc. Um, or they were, you know, maybe I had some kind of celebrity. I don't know. But uh, Twitch is very much, in our opinion, at least as creators, it is a monetization platform. YouTube, hmm. TikTok, Instagram, those are growth platforms. If you want to grow a brand and you want to succeed on Twitch, you need some kind of identity. You need to be a person of interest before you can even set foot in the realm of live broadcasting. So my advice, and I, people ask me this all the time, my DMs, you know, how can I become a streamer like Ms. Giff, Asman, whatever? Well, there's only one Mizkiv, there's only one Asm, and there's only one Emeru. But if you want to have a fair shake or at least improve your odds of success on Twitch, close the platform. Don't open it up until you start a YouTube channel. You're growing on YouTube. You're growing on TikTok. You're developing some kind of social media presence. And then once you've hit a certain critical mass, announce to your audience that you're going to go uh, you know, stream live on Twitch and preferably announce with something special come with a specific content piece or an IP, whether it be, you know, a podcast such as you guys are doing or a game show or something that's going to draw your audience inwards because there's, I think there's something like 9.7 million people broadcasted on Twitch in, in December of 2021. And maybe only, you know, one to 2000 of them are making a decent living. 
uh, and maybe only three to 5,000 of them are making an actual living. So if you want to, you know, break into that upper echelon, you can't be at zero viewers. You can't be at one viewer. Your first stream, you have to have 50, 60, 70 viewers at the very least to push yourself up in the directory. And then hopefully with your creative content ideas and your brilliance and your genius and your collaboration, you'll find a way to break, you know, forward to the top. And it's been done. Um, Aiden Ross is a great example of, of somebody that kind of just, you know, came onto the scene, was doing some GTA stuff, was playing some NDA, uh, NBA 2K, and he was huge on on Instagram, I believe. He's big on TikTok. He's big on these other platforms. And he came to Twitch and he just freaking, you know, stormed the scene. Um, Saikuno is another one that I think of, albeit he did have uh, a lot of help from Offline TV, which was an influencer collective, and they kind of, you know, propped him up. Uh, but I've seen it happen to where, you know, you can reach that one to 5,000 viewer mark on your own. But of course, I, I'll be the first to say that having an OTK, having not even a formal organization, but having a group of friends that can help you elevate your content will just be, they'll fast track you uh, even, even more quickly. And perhaps in the future, Paul, as you're saying, one day, it may be impossible to even break through unless you're part of some kind of collective. Just by the, the nature of Twitch as a kingmaker platform, it serves the top, you know, 0.01%. And everybody else kind of, you know, they, they've got to fight for the scraps. Um, but it's just how the platform's designed, I guess. It's interesting, too, because in some you you defined one of the, the characteristics of the unicorns as, you know, they're probably not playing FPS games or exclusively FPS games. Right. Mm -hmm. And And one of the conversations we hear a lot, and I'm sure you've heard a lot, is right, like, Twitch is going down the tube because it's all just chatting now, right? No one's playing games anymore. Or, you know, a lot of the big streamers are just doing just chatting. I mean, what I'm hearing from you is truly that is the right category to be in if you want to get any kind of scale on the platform. Does that in your mind leave an opening to like, is Twitch vulnerable in your mind to other potential new live streaming platforms that may be more focused on the gaming or fundamentally you think, the just chatting piece will dominate regardless of whatever new live streaming platform comes out tomorrow. In terms of vulnerability, everyone's vulnerable. Every business is vulnerable. There's always opportunity for competitors to, you know, kind of seep through the cracks and to take over. Um, Twitch in particular, of course, I think there's a lot of weaknesses to the platform. I think, you know, if you look at some of the moves that YouTube has been making, uh, especially over this past year and their projected plan for 2022, um, it seems like they're onto something. And so long as YouTube and Google are, are willing to open up that checkbook and procure talent, uh, which, you know, should be surprised to no one. There's a couple of big names that haven't announced their transition to YouTube just yet. That should be soon. Um, that's always going to be a thorn in the side of Twitch. And when any platform solves the problem of discoverability while also presenting a solid user experience, um, it's going to be trouble for Twitch. And, uh, and I guess, you know, one of the biggest signs, you know, I guess damning signs that we see for the platform, it's not all doom and gloom, by the way, I still believe in Twitch, but you know, when somebody like Ludwig is able to exit to YouTube for a monstrous payout and still retain his same viewership that he got on Twitch, if not improve it slightly, that's very scary. If, if you're on, if you're in the Twitch boardroom, and you're seeing guys leave the platform and find identical success, if not more so, that's when you got to start scratching your head and putting pen to paper and kind of, you know, revisiting the subject. But, um, but you know, I think where Twitch will always succeed is it will always be a cultural hub, just with the emote system, you know, the gifted subs, the bits, you know, Twitch drops, so many extensions, so many ways to engage with your community. It will always be, you know, that kind of avant-garde cultural hub for live streaming and gaming. Is there going to be a point where YouTube perhaps passes it, surpasses it on overall, you know, hours watched or consumed? I think it's possible. I think maybe even Facebook could do it. I think maybe even some, you know, TikTok Live is starting to starting to uh, slowly get off the ground here. Maybe that that platform arises. Um, but I do think Twitch will always just have that cultural advantage. But yeah, over time. You know, TikTok Live is one that I look at and I'm like, okay, that's really interesting because you've got the short form content. It's the biggest website in the world. Um, maybe there's an opportunity for that platform to blow up. So, yeah, I mean, 
our from our perspective, our strategic perspective as an organization, we are not quote unquote loyal to any platform. We are loyal to our audience. Where our audience wants to see us perform, whether it be on Twitch, YouTube, or on the corner of Broadway, we will be there performing and hopefully, you know, creating memorable moments. Uh, I tips. I just have one last thing for you before I hand it over to Jimmy here for everyone's favorite segment. But the, fundamentally, what is you know, what does OTK look like five years from now or 10 years from now in your mind? Like, paint me the picture of what the business looks like. So our kind of, you know, nefarious business plan, right? Our long-term, you know, cynical mobile, mogul business plan is, you know, we, we, we have aspirations to become, you know, a multimedia conglomerate. Um, we want to be making the best content with the best, coolest creators and releasing the coolest products and services that have value for our community. Um, what will OTK look like in terms of the brand itself? Similar to what it looks like now. It's always going to be a group or groups of friends playing games. Gaming is just a, such a core part of who we are. Um, but also socializing, having a good time together. Um, and, you know, hopefully uh, also, you know, that group of friends makes the best underwear, makes the best, you know, <laughs> uh, you know, just the coolest mouse pads. Who knows? You, you heard it here first. OTK there underwear is. coming soon. <laughs> there it is. Uh, there's an announcement, right? there, exclusive, but you know, to make cool products and, um, and partnering up with the brands that we think are doing the coolest shit. So coolest creators, coolest content, coolest products. The vibe should be very similar to what it is today, but just more more friends around us and uh, hopefully being able to provide more value add in the day-to-day -day to our audience. Jimmy, um, I'm going to hand it over to you. Uh, for those of you who are listening for the first time, Jimmy does a little segment here at the end of every show. We call it Judge Jimmy's Cross-Examination. And uh, tips, you're going to get five or six questions rapid fire here from Jimmy. Uh, to, to hopefully uncover a little bit of, more about you as a person and your personality. Judge Jimmy, take it away. No, pr no pressure either, Tips, but, <laughs> but that was a tough one to, to follow. So, all right, first one, what is your go-to gamer snack or drink? Ooh, see, um, my wife will want me to say water and celery, but, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I got to give a shout out to Game Fuel. I got my Game Fuel and my Kit Kat bar next to me every single day. But let's not talk about that, you know? I but, love, yeah. I love yeah. Kit Kats. I'm with you on that one. I, yeah. uh, I know you said you hadn't played in a while. Uh, and we did talk at length uh, about your streaming gaming history. I suppose I'll change it to what's your favorite game to watch others stream as opposed to streaming yourself? Mm, that's a good one. So. I really like, I just enjoy good content and good entertainment. And I'm going to try not to give a cop out answer here, but you know, there are some days when, you know, for example, when simply Clint Stevens, Miz and Emeru are doing a Mario 64 speed run. I'm super into it. I'm watching it. I'm loving it. They're going back and forth, having a good time. But then, you know, next day I try to watch Mario 64. They're not playing it. I'm not watching it. You know right. what I mean? I love watching the games and the streams where the streamers themselves are having a good time and there's just a lot of entertainment value from the streamers themselves. I never thought, you know, I'm not a big league guy. I used to play Dota 2 back in the day, but I'm not a big league guy. I never thought I'd be watching as much League of Legends as I have been the past, you know, two weeks or so. Why am <laughs> I watching it? Because my friends are playing it. Because Soda Pop and Moon Moon, Mizkif, Amaru, Esmond, they're all playing it and they're having a great time with each other. And that that energy kind of comes through the screen onto me and, and just allows me to enjoy it. So wherever the best entertainers, whatever games they're playing, I just naturally gravitate and watch those streams. Love it. Makes a lot of sense. Um, all right. Next one. What is your favorite show or movie adapted from a video game? You know, this would have been a much more difficult question <laughs> like four or five months ago, but after the yeah. bar that arcane said, it's like, you can't, I arcane by not a mile by freaking like really better than the witcher that much better i should oh, say so i haven't i haven't watched season two yet so i'm definitely behind okay um i i it's crazy with the witcher i don't remember much of what happened 
It, it just okay. it didn't stick with me. I remember enjoying it at the time. I do have like some some faint memories of I think it kind of tapered off towards the end a little bit and just the last few episodes didn't stick with me as much. But with Arcane, you know, I remember it was like what a month or two ago whenever it came out. Time's just going by so fast. But I wasn't planning on watching it. I was just working on a side monitor. Oh, this new Riot, you know, show came out. Um, I'll check it out. You know, I'll watch maybe a few minutes of the first episode, finish the first episode. You know, let me, you know, that was pretty cool. Let me follow it up. How do they do a number two? Finish the second episode, third. I didn't watch it right when it came out. I waited till the full season came out. I ended up binging it in one night just because I couldn't nice. stop watching. It was so good. And <laughs> I think the bar is there and everything else is kind of like way down here. So any in terms of video game based, Arcane by a mile. Shout, shout out Riot. Yeah. Nice. All right. <laughs> I know I know they're listening. So I, I know for a fact. <laughs> well, some right. big uh, fans we, at Riot of the podcast. We got one we got one more here. Um, you know, given your current position, uh, you know, C suite for a major media platform and brand, you know, if you could go back to school, back to college, uh, what class or major would you pursue? that you think may better prepare you for, for what you're doing today and what you'd recommend, you know, to anyone young and in that position and with, with that on their mind. I'll give you two answers to this one. One of them is kind of a cop out, um, <laughs> but I'm very happy with where I am today. And I recognize that the journey of life uh, essentially is a composition of very, very small, delicately stacked bricks, basically. And if you move one, you know, however small or seemingly insignificant, if you end up taking the right road instead of the left road at a certain junction in your life, everything could change. So for me personally, what would I go back and do? I would go back and retrace my exact steps because it got me to where I am today. And I'm very happy with where I am today. Um, so end up majoring, you know, in engine construction, engineering management, and even it seems not intuitive, right? But that's what I would do personally. But for those out there that want to get into the industry, so many opportunities, I mean, and it's actually, it, I mean, depending on which path you want to take, if you want to get into like, you know, game development, for example, something that's a little bit more technical, um, you know, I'm, I, it's probably out of my depth to even suggest something, but I would imagine something more on the software engineer side or the game design side, et cetera. But if you want to get into more of the entertainment side of the industry, whether it be streaming, content creation, even esports, um, I would say it's it's probably a lot more of a traditional route than you might think. I mean, marketing is such a big part of what we do. You know, just straight up business degrees, management degrees, um, you know, accounting, finance. There's in a lot of ways, this industry is just like any other. There's you know the, the main core tenets of of business. You've got operation, strategy, finance, HR, et cetera. Um, but if you want to go on the entertainment side and you want to go purely live streaming content creation, I'm one of those, I'm one of those people that believes a lot of it is just, it's not so much of what you study. It's just who you are and, and who you've become over just your life, man. Like I look at Mizkiff. Mizkiff is like one of the best entertainers I've ever met on stream and off stream. He's in the room, great energy. He's cracking you up. And you go and you watch clips of him or videos when he was a kid. He's, he's been the same way his whole life. Uh, I don't know how you can coach that, really. It's, I think it's just one thing that just it, it's inherited a lot of it. Um, but if you just want to get into the industry, have a love and passion for the game or the direction you want to go in and be the top 1%. You know, you can't really control where you end up, but you control how you're approaching your life. Work hard, you know, take any direction but make sure you're always at the top of your game and a path will open in front of you. These, I love these it. are great. These are great. Paula, uh, the pot, the prosecution rests back to you. Um, tips. How, if, uh, you know, obviously our audience is mostly a lot of business people and professionals, but, um, I know probably you don't want to be found or hounded or followed in some way, but you know, where can people sort of follow what you guys are doing in general as a business? If you want to check out what OTK is doing, just, Twitter.com slash OTK network at OTK network on pretty much any platform. You can find us on YouTube, Twitch, et cetera. Check out any of our streamers, Asmongold, Mizkif, Emeru, Seer, Tech, Tone, Rich, Espan, Nick, Schlatt, everybody. They're, they're all over uh, social media. Um, we're, we're building a website. We promise 
uh, <laughs> that got deprioritized somewhere along the way. I don't know how we've managed a year and a half without one, but, uh, but yeah, I think for us, it's, you know, find us where the content is and, uh, you won't have to look too far. Hopefully tips. I really appreciate it. I hope people listen to this episode a few times over just so many, so much great insight in here. Uh, thank you so much for taking the time and for being here and, uh, I love what you guys are doing at OTK. Uh, I just think it's going to be such obviously already a huge success, but I know even bigger success for you guys on the horizon. Jimmy, thank you as always, uh, for everyone listening, watching, thank you guys for tuning in, uh, make sure you follow us everywhere. Business of esports or busy sports, basically on every social media platform and subscribe to the podcast. Tell your friends about it. If you enjoy the content. And as always, we will see you guys next week. Cheers, guys.